Hello, and welcome to Jay Hutch Talks Too Much. I'm Jesse. I am uh, the host of this podcast. Tonight, we are talking about uh, the great um, 1948 Italian film, The Bicycle Thief, or Bicycle Thieves, um, depending on which side you're on. And um, yeah, remember also as well, if you're watching, to uh, like and subscribe if you like and want to subscribe to this. Um, I'm very excited tonight because I have a... Uh, a guest with me. I have uh, my friend Anders, who is, I'm going to bring him into the podcast now. Uh, Anders is a uh, film scholar. He uh, is uh, part of the uh, um, Three Brothers Film, which is a uh, website and also Three Brothers Film Fast that he does with his brothers, uh, Anton and Aaron. Um, Anders, good to have you on. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I guess we'll just sort of hop right into it. Uh, the Bicycle Thief is, I, I call it the Bicycle Thief. I realize most people call it Bicycle, bicycle Thieves. Thief. Yeah, yeah, Bicycle Thieves is the more correct uh, term, uh, more correct uh, translation of the film. But um, yeah, I mean, this is a movie that I probably watched for the first time in my undergrad, I think. I took an Italian cinema class uh, when I was about 20, 21 years old. And I really liked it then, but it, it had probably been about 15 years after that uh, until I watched it again. And then the second time that I watched it, I kind of ranked another De Sica film over The Bicycle Thief for a while in my list. I guess. Is it Umberto D? It was Umberto D, yeah. I, I love, I, I, which I still think is a fantastic movie. Um, and is still, you know, I would say it's probably one of my top 20 or 25 movies. But, um, but the second time I watched The uh, I watch Bicycle Thieves. I don't know if it's if it's just being older. It kind of hit me a little bit harder, um, but it had a real effect. And then I think I think when I watched it again in preparation for this, I think it was only maybe the third time that I I watched it. But um, still, I think is is an absolutely phenomenal movie. And like all of my favorite movies, it pretty much kind of hits me on a more of an emotional level first than it does an, an intellectual level. But we haven't actually talked about this movie no. at all. So, um, so you just rewatched it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'd wa seen it in well over a decade, maybe yeah. 2010, 2011. Uh, I saw it for the first time also in the early 2000s. Uh, I think I got it from a library. It was one of the first, if not the first Italian uh, film I had seen. And it was only, I think I saw it actually before I even saw Eight and a Half or any Fellini. Right. Which is kind of interesting. But, yeah, um, yeah, because I would say I would probably say eight and a half was my was my first Italian language film that I saw. But uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, you, you come to a film like this always with like this like huge uh, like weight of like oh it's great film right like it literally topped the sight and sound uh, top film list within a decade of its release right yeah. so. Um, and it has a good it has a good cross sort of pollination because it's it's a yeah. kind of film it's a good foreign film to show people who are are a bit hesitant about foreign film i yeah. think i think that's true yeah so it's, it's kind of a good way in so you've seen it you've also seen it about two or three times probably at least three maybe yeah. i'm not sure if, i think three yeah yeah, <laughs> so it goes back to before you know. I was in a. I, I've always been somewhat obsessive about uh, making lists of what I like to, what I've watched, and and the, how my you know thoughts on them change, even if it's just a star rating or whatever. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I would have. I didn't actually go back and look through all my like pre, uh, you know, online uh, blogging of films and and check, but I'm pretty sure it's three times I've seen it. I, I'm I'm very compulsive about list making, and this is uh, I'm I th I'm pretty sure I have a problem. To be perfectly honest, that, I think many okay. many film fans do. Too. Yeah, so this is number six on my list of all of time movies, all time. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So it's very high right now. I mean, it, yeah. it could change yeah, yeah. eventually, yeah. but 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 it's been six for for a while, probably for the last couple of years. So um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a big favorite of mine. So, so what did you think when you when you watched it for the? No, it, it holds up. It, I still think it's a, a masterpiece. Uh, it's a you know a great introductory film to neorealism. I don't know. I think I I still may prefer now 
the like Rossellini's films, especially his his war trilogy and some of those, um, the other Italian neorealist films that I've seen, uh, and I obviously I've uh, you know I've got grown to appreciate Fellini since the first time I saw Bicycle Thieves, um, and actually only recently re- uh, watched for the first time this year La Strada, which I think is also a remarkable film. But there's some similarities there, and as you say, you know the they hit you on an emotional level first. Yeah. Even though you would think that given the, you know, somewhat austere production, the shooting on location, non-professional actors, at least in the case of Bicycle Thieves. Um, but, you know, they're, I think they're primarily emotional. And one of the things like teaching film history myself, uh, I teach or have taught Rome Open City usually as the, you know, the very first uh, neorealist film as the one and one of the things that I, I note to students and this I am cribbing this somewhat from David Bordwell and Kristen Thompson's film history book but the the neorealist films are not as uh you know like they're this is not slow cinema this is not uh you know something that's going to test your patience if you've never jumped into any of these films it yeah. they they're a little more actually despite having you know the, the non-professional actors shooting on location trying to give some uh you know view of everyday regular people's lives and things like that um you know they're still playing with cinema they're you know they're still they're edited they're paced uh at a particular way that the way they've developed the scripts you know uh still hits a bit of an entertainment uh value there so i would that's what i would say to anyone who watches this who's not who's never seen any of these like you're not it's not like this is some you know, difficult, challenging text that you have to steal yourself for. It's also nice and short, hour and 30 minutes. Uh, you know, you, you might cry at the end. Uh, I don't know. But, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get what you want in terms yeah. of entertainment. <clears throat> I'm never sure if it's a good thing to talk about the end of the movie, but I feel like it's impossible to not talk about it. So we, I think we will talk a little bit yeah. about the end of the movie a, a little bit later, maybe closer to the end of the of the uh, discussion. But, yeah, I mean, I think that that's that's – a great way of putting it because um, it is bicycle thieves is only an hour and a half. It, it really moves. Like you, you get a kind of a, a pretty good sense of movement. There's, there's no sort of slow section. I don't think, I mean, it's not like, it's not a Marvel movie, but it's, it, it, it it's paced very well. Yeah. But and that's the thing. There's still like moments. I mean, we can get into specific scenes that you like and stuff, but like, I do yeah. appreciate the, this uh, like uh, gives moments to to dwell on the way people live you know uh, a shot of a kitchen and what people are doing or you know uh just the day-to-day life it's not uh you know this isn't even though i said it's a little bit hollywood it's still it's not that classical hollywood editing where you're cutting for efficiency and you know you gotta cut out anything extraneous to to plot in that sense yeah, and he does. He does leave, I guess, a sort of a mark of De Sica and maybe several of the neorealist filmmakers, is that he, he has a tendency of lingering on moments, mm-hmm. um, which is which is really interesting. Like you go a little bit longer than than you than a regular Hollywood film might, and I, and again, I think I think a lot of people watching it might think, okay, it's a nineteen forty eight black and white film. Maybe this is just a case of the way filmmaking was back then. But I, I think that in fact, it was an actual significant stylistic choice that, that he was making. And and one that was quite different from a lot of Hollywood movies that would have been made around that time as yeah. well. If you watch Hollywood movies from the time, they're, they're even more snappy and tight. Like pacing is something that classic Hollywood of the 40, 30s and 40s had down pat, I feel. Yeah. Um, well, along those lines, like, and actually... I, we should probably maybe talk about what neorealism is. And I think to some degree, you've almost already explained it by talking mm-hmm. about how, you know, it's it's movies overwhelmingly featuring non-professional actors. So the guy who's th- the, the main character of, of Bicycle Thieves, Antonio Ricci, I'm not, I don't know his, I don't know the actor's name. I probably should have. I, I have it right here. It's, okay, what is it? It's Lamberto Maggiorani. Okay. And he was a. And I like how you used your hands to uh, <laughs> to say his name. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, he was a um, non-professional. He was a steel worker, right? Some yeah, like he he was like a, in a laborer. Yeah. Yeah. 
and he's fantastic. He's amazing in this movie. Yeah, he's 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 excellent in the film. And 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 also, I, it, this probably gets said a lot. Uh, I I didn't read a lot of. I haven't read a lot of scholarly works on this, mm -hmm. or a lot of criticism on it, just in general. But I'm sure a lot of people have commented on the sun as a really yeah, Bruno good is, performance as well, uh, which is what maybe the greatest child performance ever on film. It's up there. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think it's, I, I don't know. It's uh, the one moment of the film that I always, that I, that I always think is, and I don't know why there's nothing particularly special about it, but there's one moment of that movie where it starts to rain and uh, they they go he, they run for cover the father and the son because most of this movie if you haven't seen it fo follows the father and the son and uh, as he looks for okay I'll let, I'll just Let's say give, the a, a little, <laughs> give a little brief summary of the plot yeah why, why is it called bicycle thief What's yeah so doing? so um, Ricci uh, starts off with him being amongst a large group of people who are. Um, vying for jobs and uh ricci antonio ricci gets gets offered this job and he's told okay you have to bring your bicycle and he doesn't have a bicycle or he's just hawked his bicycle is what has happened and um and so then he goes and he gets his bicycle back uh and on and he's his job is largely putting up interestingly enough and i want to talk about this movie posters yeah. and um and so he's putting up movie posters on the wall and while he's doing that up on a ladder somebody comes and steals his bike and the, the bike is 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 just essential for for his job right he needs to have this bike in order to have the job and and he's desperate as are virtually all italians in this film are are desperate for work We'll talk about that, I hope, as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so th the rest of the movie is his desperate attempt to relocate his bicycle. Um, and at first he goes to get help from one of his friends, but largely the movie is him and uh, his son, Bruno, um, searching the streets of Rome to try to uh, find his bicycle. And, and, and that's a, that's essentially the movie. Mm -hmm. um, but at one point it does it starts to rain and they they take for cover and they they they're underneath this this kind of this shelter area and and the 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 camera focuses on him going through and the sun falls down into into like a puddle and and he doesn't the father doesn't notice and that's the thing about these movies is that this movie is that there, it's so there's so many kind of perfectly sort of real moments because you know you have kids i have a child and just there's there's just things that are sort of you i'm sure of you experienced that are beyond your control you don't notice and he's like drying himself off and the son is really kind of dramatically drying himself off and the father says to the son what happened and because he's really like overdoing it and Bruno's like, I fell down. And he's very upset. Like, I fell down. Didn't you see that I fell down there? Which he didn't. And that that particular moment just strikes me as it's so real. And I remember the first time I watched it in my Italian cinema class in undergrad, the whole the whole class laughed. And the laughter was just like, I know this experience. Like I've yeah. I've been through this before or I've seen this before. And uh, and that's just one of sort of so many great moments in this film that, that just feel incredibly real. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. The, uh, you know, there's, it seem, may seem strange like to say, to go back to what I was saying earlier about this, the neorealists, um, you know, this, there was this attempt to, yeah, essentially do what you're, what you're saying to recreate moments uh, of day-to-day -day life in, on screen. Um, you know, uh, one of my favorite film critics, the, probably the one of the only people I've really read much about neorealism who guides a lot of my thoughts about it is Andre Bazin, the, mm. the French uh, film critic and writer. But, um, you know, the other thing, though, is like to go back to what I said, though, there is still like a, a plot that drives you forward, like, but it's not, um, how should I say? it's not contrived. Like we've all experienced this thing. You, there's this thing that you have to get and your job depends on it. So the stakes feel real. Hmm. The, uh, you know, the fear that, you know, Antonio Ricci feels is like real in yeah. that sense. Um, 
And I think that's, that's sort of a key thing, but it also, you know, it sets up very, what we talk about in film uh, structures and stuff, it, there is a goal oriented uh, plot, right? It's not just everyday slice life, even though he incorporates that in that, that. I think that's what I was trying to say in the sense that sometimes films try your patience because you're like, what's going on here? What's the point? And nobody's going to watch this movie and be like, what's the point of this movie? You understand very clearly the stakes, the, the goal, uh, and then how do people, regular people deal with that, I think is kind of uh, what you get out of that. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I would say is interesting. You, you mentioned the idea that the film, um, all these moments that like you can relate to, right? What I was struck on this most recent watching is some of the things that are the same in terms of like broader human experiences of family, of labor, work, of, you know, those, those kinds of issues, but then also struck by how much is different, right? Mm -hmm. like this is 1948, just after World War II, uh, you know, Italy up until the late fifties was, I think one of the things I was struck watching this movie and then watching La Strada earlier this year is the devastation that World War II uh, caused in Europe, mm -hmm. right? Compared to say with to a comparable North American film at mm -hmm. the time set in the U S obviously, you know, post-war U S was booming. Europe was being reconstructed after literally the most devastating uh, war in human history. Um, and, but it, so there's that difference that these people are Europeans, but they're living in the rubble of a war. Yeah. Right? And just to pause on that for one second, um, so during this period too, uh, most of Europe, their unemployment rate is going to be something like 25 to 30%. And, and some areas will be even higher. I would imagine Italy as a member of the Axis mm -hmm. would have been suffering even more during, during that period. I don't know for sure. I don't have the, the And the number. suffering lasted a lot longer into, yeah. you know, the fifties. Yeah. So, um, that is, as you say correctly, in comparison to the United States, which is now at the very beginning stages of what will be the greatest economic boom really in history mm -hmm. um, from from post from 1945 to 1970, essentially. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, you're you, it, you're right. There, there are some significant differences there that you see. And then things like the fact that Bruno himself has a job. You know, I, 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 I kind of laughed last night, you know, the scene when you know, and Antonio, there's a scene, he gets his new uniform for his job and his, you know, his, he gets it out and his, him and his wife have some, some nice little scenes where they're talking about his cap and how he looks so professional, you know, ready to go out on his job, but then they get ready in the morning and Bruno also has his little outfit on that they're, you know, cause he goes and works as a sweet street sweeper and, and, you know, like the idea of child labor. Yeah. That's, you know, something that could be, uh, you know, I hope, <laughs> I hope for most of our viewers unfamiliar, yeah. Um, and you know, little things like that, that they don't, I don't think they take you out of the film, but you, you, you see how much has changed in some of these countries over the, you know, the last 70 years. It's yeah, absolutely. So you, you see some differences and, and <clears throat> now to give you the other side, I feel like one of the, like one of the things, the questions I was going to ask is what you think of how the, the movie does in, sort of engage with, with class issues. Mm hmm and so, and one of the things that really struck me this time was the that the movie really does an excellent job of demonstrating the humiliation of being poor, mm -hmm. and it does that right from the from the moment the movie starts, right? Where it doesn't it's romanticize it, yeah. It doesn't romanticize it. It's people begging for work. Um, it shows a guy taking a job, even though he knows that he actually shouldn't have that job and and when it just for a moment becomes a possibility that he might not have the bike to do the job everybody swarms in to say i could do it i could do it i can do it right there's just total yeah. it's desperation but it's a very public desperation nobody's yeah. nobody is being shy about how desperate they are and then they and then the reason why he doesn't have a bike is because he had to is because he had to hawk it to get money and then to get the bike back they need to hawk their sheets exactly and then and then the guy and then the guy says some of these are dirty and then you just used, see they're like, used sheets, yeah. They're used sheets, yeah. And then he and then you see and he takes them back into that yeah. room. That room. The room. 
that room is is crazy, right? Because you have these shelves upon shelves upon shelves of these sheets. So this is not just one guy's problem. This no. is the whole nation's problem. And and to me, I, it it struck me as like, where's that money? The money to you know pawn these things out to people coming from somebody has some money, right? And somebody's hoarding this stuff, whether it's bicycles or bed sheets. Um, it, it reminded me. It reminds me even in the um, the aftermath of a war these poverty and the distribution of resources is not, you know, level playing ground. Somebody yeah. during the war got rich and is in a position to be able to, to run this, this pawn shop. Right. Yeah. It's, and it's not a pawn shop. Like we think of in contemporary world, like watch the movie, like these, they need ladders to climb up to the upper shelves to stack these sheets in. Yeah. It's, 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 it's crazy. Definitely a striking that, that scene struck me more this time than the previous times watching it. Yeah. And and it's interesting because we don't really see that many depictions of wealth in the movie. Um, it's mostly people who are living in poverty. Um, we see one example of, a, of wealth, I think. I, mean, I could be wrong, but I feel like there's one significant example, which is when he goes to the restaurant, when he takes uh, Bruno to the restaurant. And there's that other table of, and there's that snooty boy. Yeah, uh, the rich, real rich kid. Yeah. yeah, who keeps looking over at Bruno. And Bruno, again, like, again, it's another sort of moment of humiliation because Bruno, in that moment, obviously feels uh, different and he feels inferior. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, like, I don't know, that, that idea of humiliation, I feel, really runs through. This is This is a guy who we are watching who is humiliated right as the movie begins, but it, it gets, it gets keep, it keeps getting worse and worse as it goes on. And the hard decisions that poverty puts people into. Yeah. Making, right. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. And, some, and sometimes, I mean, we can, we, you know, it's a bit early to, to get into talking about the end of the film, but like yeah. the, you know, there's no good decisions ever really. Like even his decision to take the job at the beginning of the movie, knowing that, uh, am I going to be able to get my bike back from the pawn shop? Was you know some someone might, you know, criticize a person for saying, "Well, you shouldn't have taken that job." Yeah, right? I think. But what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? I think we have to say what happens at the yeah. end of the movie. To be honest, yeah. so, I mean, so people have had seventy years to. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay, if you haven't watched it and you don't want to be spoiled, pause it now. I've given you it. I've given you a link to to watch the movie on YouTube. It's not a, the greatest version of it, but it's also on the Criterion channel. If you have that, it is on the Criterion channel. There's a little plug there, um, and uh, are you for that? Uh, no, they are not. <laughs> um, but but uh, so at the end of the movie, um, you know, it is like there is a kind of like it a hero's uh, <laughs> a hero's journey kind of going on mm -hmm. here. Oh, I think oh, uh, somebody hasn't watched it. I haven't watched it. So. Okay, pause it. I know who this is. Pause it and watch the movie. Come back. Maybe we'll still be going. It's a very short movie. You never know. Wow. Well, <laughs> although if you don't, I'm I'm gonna say okay. I'll tell. You, I am not a person who believes really in movie spoilers per se. I don't believe a great movie. It, it very rare. Like okay, if you've never seen Psycho, don't spoil it for yourself. You've never seen. Yeah, but that spoiler sense. comes a half an hour into the movie. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is, like, I don't think anyone's appreciation for this film is going to be ruined by knowing the ending. In fact, you may be able to appreciate it more knowing ahead of time. Like, there's this idea that the pleasure of a movie is in plot, in what right. happens next. And yeah. I actually think that one of the things that non Hollywood films often do is push us beyond that kind of appreciation for cinema right like a lot of these movies especially if you're watching old movies um if you're at all familiar like i mean I'm the kind of people who i'm hope you know might be led to seek these movies out you probably have done some reading about it and you're maybe encountering you're not encountering them fresh nobody's opinion is you know you just don't have that opportunity unless you can travel back in time and, and see it at the time um so a lot like you know a lot of what we've been describing was is even little moments pacing character work um you know context history these are kind of the things that give these films their pleasures as well i really appreciate it actually this time a 
also to see because like camera work and mm. like it's really good like yeah. the, the movement like there's actually a lot of camera movement in this movie uh long takes where he moves through space to show you that this isn't a set this is a real apartment building this right. is the streets of the city you know which We're i don't not... know if you said but that's another important aspect of neorealism that it's yeah. that it's outside of the studio that it's um that it is out in the open air basically out in the streets essentially mm -hmm. um uh rather than a, a filmed on on a set yeah so that's just my little thing that like maybe that's foreign to you and maybe that's too much maybe you 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 really want to you know uh not know the plot but the uh i do think that the pleasures of a movie like this are if they might even be enhanced by not having to pay attention like to to worry about did i miss something what's going to happen next uh that kind of yeah thing. well and i don't think i don't think that the payoff of this movie is is how the plot resolves basically i think i think I do think, um, again, just to preface what I'll probably say later on, uh, I do think that the very last minute is maybe as effective as any last minute in a movie that I've seen. But um, but has, that has nothing to do with the plot. It just has to do with how this movie has emotionally prepared you for this moment exactly. that happens at the end of the movie. The emotional payoff, even if you know the plot, comes from the hour and 25 minutes that we spent with these characters yeah yeah exactly exactly so then in that case i don't think i'm ruining anything by saying that at the end of the movie uh in a moment of desperation uh ricci the father antonio um sees a bike tries to steal it does not get away with it is is humiliated once again and maybe the worst humiliation mm -hmm. the worst because his son sees it Right. I would say. I think who, that who that. yeah, who it should be to make it clear the son wasn't aware of his father's attempt. Yeah. Yeah, because he he tries Sent to send away, the, yeah. sends the son uh to another spot, says I'll see I'll meet you in this area. But on the train, I'll yeah. meet you back home. Yeah. But the son decides to not get on the bus and then sees his father getting chased by the people who's you know, the guy whose bike he stole and a bunch of other people. Then they get him off the bike, they you know, they they slap him in the face. They um, they threaten to take him to the police. The son is crying. It's it's really a, a, a very devastating moment at the at, close to the end of the movie. And um, but uh, yeah, again, like once that moment happens, it it forces you to reevaluate the, this whole thing that has put this movie in motion, which is this terrible guy stole his bike. But what's that guy's situation? What's that guy's story? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So and I think this is why I will come back to you said, you know, the preferred title of the movie. Yes. Whether it's Bicycle Thief, The Bicycle Thief, or Bicycle Thieves. Yeah. It's like, if you go by the singular, who's the bicycle thief? Right. Is it, you know, the guy, the the, 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 the unnamed thief he's chasing, I believe it's unnamed, or is it the, uh, you know, is it Antonio? Yeah. Or it is, there's two thieves, right? And yeah. that, I think, now, if we can get into talking about class and things like that, that I would say if there's any kind of like message or theme, it would be that poverty and desperation can drive anyone into becoming a thief in some yeah. way. Well, yeah, because the other the other thing too is that there's Antonio, there is the so-called bicycle thief, but then there's also the part of the movie where they go to that that spot where they're remaking all the bicycles from different stolen bicycle yep. parts. Everybody is a market. It's like a street market or something. Yeah. Yeah. So they're all bicycle thieves. I mean, this this whole economic system has forced people into does nothing but force people into crime, but also just in general behavior that they wouldn't normally do. Like another another aspect too is it's a very short moment, and and I think if it were done today, it would be played up much more than it is. But there's a moment in the movie where Antonio hits his son, uh, which obviously is horrible. And and again, that's another moment. I, I mean, I wouldn't know. I've never known from that kind of thing. So I don't know what, what it looks like in real life, that kind of abuse, but fortunately. Yeah, it's not but, that I'm familiar with. Yeah, but I do feel like Bruno's reaction in that is very real too. 
Because mm-hmm. he's he just it's a it's a moment of where he feels betrayed. This 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 guy who he clearly looks up to um, throughout the whole film, he's following him around on this on this journey. It's and his father. It's his, his father. father. It's his father. Yeah, and um, and and also like you know it, it does it does like obviously like he's just been following this kind of crazy journey as it goes on, and he he takes his job very seriously, right? Like when they go to the market, he's like, okay, I'm gonna look at all the handles and the bells. Just- yeah, they're like equals in some ways, you know, and and that's how he ends up treating them. Um, but again, not to, I'm not justifying what he does in that moment, what the father does, but it's a moment of desperation. Like it's a total moment of desperation. Right. He's he's just, he's just confronted. I think it's right after he's confronted the old man in the, in the church or the, yeah. And, um, yeah. yeah. And, and at that moment, he just doesn't know what to do. Like his mind is, and that, and that's his reaction. Again, totally not justifiable, but it's it's like this whole system has led to this moment, right? Yeah. And where he's just desperate and he doesn't know what to do and he doesn't know how to act. So it's like all this, all this otherwise, this otherwise probably would not happen, right? All these yeah. sort of violent acts, these criminal acts, and so on and so forth. I think the film there's that ten, there's so you, you you identify a central tension thematically between the idea that our material circumstances can lead us to to make choices that we might otherwise not make to commit yeah. crimes to hit people and for those of us who have fortunately never experienced those things unless you are put in that test in that situation it's not to justify as you said but to say you don't know how you would react in those situations mm-hmm. like if you've never been in a war you've never been starving then it's hard to say what more what social mores or ethical moral norms that you follow that you would be prepared to to break i think that yeah. that's a key thing at the same time that the film never sets up its characters as purely victims it, it grants them a sense of agency and dignity if you want to call it that mm-hmm. to some degree mm-hmm. um and so there's that so it never is like well this is just purely structural he you know had no choice but neither does it say that, you know, oh, well, he could totally had a moral choice and he could have been a good person if he, you know, it just followed the rules. Well, if he had followed the rules, he wouldn't have got the job to begin with. Right. Yeah. 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 That's so true. There's that the film asks you and it doesn't resolve that tension. It, it says to you, what would you do? Yeah. How, how would you react in a sense? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. And to go back to your point about the, about like the stakes, like, as you say, a lot, of, if you go into like a writing class, a lot of them will tell you like, you know, your, your characters need to, to want something. Uh, they got, they have to have a, have a need or a want. And obviously on some level, you know, it's, I want my bike back, but, but really the stakes are so much higher than that. It's like, I need to live. Um, if I don't have this bike, I don't know how we're going to live. Yeah. Um, you, and, you think about how little it gets, they say how much he gets paid, like what? 7,500 lira. I don't know how much that is equivalently, but yeah. it's it's so little that it like sounds like it's like barely covers their rent kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And also again, that scene when they're in the restaurant and he's like, We're gonna and it's such an impulsive act, right? Mm-hmm. And he, and it clearly is demonstrated as an impulsive act because as soon as they sit down and start eating, he's regretting the fact that they're <laughs> that they're even there and he starts to to talk about the money that they need. And that sets Bruno, the son, off. He starts to not want to eat either. Mm-hmm. Like, and again, it's like, oh, like uh, you feel so bad for the son in this, but you also yeah. feel really bad for Antonio as well. Yeah. But uh, that, that's a, a great, a great point as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I didn't, I hadn't thought about this either until until this time watching the movie. But um, again, interesting that this movie comes out in 1948 which is a big year in Italy. Um, they're, 1948, they're having an election, parliamentary election. And uh, at this time... And that would, would that be the first one post-war? Uh, I don't think so, actually. No. I'm not sure, but I don't think so. I think they actually had pretty frequent elections, but... but uh, parliamentary system can do that. Yeah. And, um, but, it's a, but it is a big one. And, and one thing that's behind it is... Um, you have a rise of the communist and socialist parties, yeah. um, but you have the Christian Democrat party, which is more of a sort of centrist um, um, 
friendly to sort of international yep. monetary they're, system. They're a liberal party. Yep. Yeah, liberal party. So the United States gives the Christian Democrat Party at that time $150 million, uh, basically to try and, and to make sure that they win that 1948 election. To um, and, and it's conditional because that the money was to ensure that if, if the socialist or communist parties won, or if they started working with them, that 150 million check would be canceled essentially. Yeah. That's, um, I think that is, that's an important context is that Italy is one of the few, if not the, you know, France obviously had a, a, a communist and socialist movement, but the communists were in Italy were one of the only Western non-Soviet bloc nations that had significant power and length, uh, you know, up until the end of the Cold War, the Italian communist power was a significant presence, right? This is a nice comment. Yeah, I'm glad we made you want to watch it. Yeah, That's absolutely. Great. That's good. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And so they, they, there was a vested interest to try and make sure that they didn't win, right. uh, which is interesting in light of stuff about interference going on in the last couple of years, that that's, uh, that, that was something that was an going old game. On. It's an old game. It's an old game, very old game. So the, the Christian Democrats won the election in 1948, but, uh, I, I'm, I, I thought maybe, and I wasn't entirely sure. And, and, it, and if it's, and if it is there, it's interesting how sort of co covert it is because there's that moment where, um, Antonio goes to find his friend to find out where the bike might be. And he wanders into a meeting. I don't know if you recall this moment, but he wanders into this meeting. And um, and I'm just trying to see, let me go. I, I wrote the actual quote down because he overhears this this moment where it's, uh, let me see. Uh, can I see it? Did I write it down? Uh, without work, people can't be placed in jobs. We've raised this issue with the Department of Labor. A welfare check solves nothing. It just humiliates the workers and doesn't help anything. We need a massive program of public works. I, I feel he's wandered into some kind of socialist, communist. No, uh, I think that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. La the, a labor, like, I, I just did a quick Googling here. And the, uh, yeah, in the 48 election, the communists joined uh, with, what was called the PS, the, so, the PSI, and created a popular democratic front that they, they did lose to the Christian Democrats, but yeah, it was a broad labor uh, movement specifically focused around labor issues. So. Yeah, so there was there was a, a, a large amount of support for them. Obviously, it would have been hard to beat that you know one hundred fifty million dollar backed Christian Democrat party, but um, but obviously, yeah. So it's it, it's an interesting moment, and mm -hmm. and. Because he sees that and then he leaves. But then you think, well, maybe that's the group of people that could have helped him. <laughs> could have yeah. helped him. You know, maybe if he joined that group. And that kind of also makes me think of what happens in, in the last moment. Actually, I'll just I'll bring yeah. it up now. Because that, that very last moment where him and his son are sort of holding hands. I think they're holding hands. Walking down, or at least they're walking together walking down away, the street yeah. with with uh, a, a group of other workers. Essentially, it really reminds me of um, Chaplin, in a way. There's a kind of a, a Chaplin esque quality. The kid, the kid and the tramp, kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it I really reminds that. me of modern times, actually, a little bit because you have um, with the group of the workers. And stuff. Yeah, it's almost a blending together of the of the first part of modern times and the last part because the first part is that sort of group of workers. The last part is the tramp and his girlfriend sort of yeah. walking off in the distance, and there's a. That and City Lights for Chaplin are very have these very ambiguous endings, right? You could read them as being very positive. You could write, read them as being very negative. And uh, I, my first instinct would have been to say, okay, the ending of Bicycle Thieves is very negative because, like, honestly, the worst has just happened to this guy and he's working with this group. But the other part of it is he's part of a movement. Like, he's part of a group of people there at the end. Solidarity. And yeah, there is something there is something that's going on there, and, and that coupled with that earlier moment in the movie, I think mm -hmm. is quite interesting. Do you know much about De Sica's politics himself? No, but I think that one of his writers, I don't know if it was the writer of Bicycle Thieves, was a was a Marxist. So, okay. yeah, I know I know that 
obviously Rossellini and uh, obviously people like Visconti and others were uh, sympathetic, if not is deeply involved in the socialist and communist movements. But I yeah, sure about Topeka because I don't know too much about him. I'm not as sure either, and I don't know who the writer was, but I but I had heard that um, somewhere that uh, one of his writers. Although uh, now that I'm looking at the at the list of writers for the movie, there's there's uh, six there's writers. Number, but I think that has to do with that they, you know, different people. They they basically started with a, a rough treatment. They didn't have a screenplay per se, right? Yeah. As they put it together, and I think if I recall, it has they was it somewhat based on a book or something. Oh, it may have been. Yeah, no? I'm not sure. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it may have been. I think it may yeah. have been. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I, I obviously neorealism. I think it's worth coming back to that point that whatever the, his specific politics, they were. Uh, it was an anti-fascist um, film movement. Italian cinema was quite uh, big during even under the fascists because Mussolini spent a lot of money on making Italian cinema a thing, and so. Yeah. Uh, they, there was a lot of money put into that, and the neorealists were consciously trying to create like an alternative cinema to the the sort of the fascist dominated cinema. Cinema, yeah. Sense. And I think it's also important key to note that the at the end of the movie that the the uh, the soccer stadium, the football stadium that he steals the bike from outside, was the fascist national stadium. Oh really? Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. So he he is he's kind of stealing from like it's obviously the people are just going to see. I think. Both Lazio and Roma, if you're a football fan, played in that stadium until the, the late 50s and then built new ones. But uh, And it had hosted the World Cup in 1934. I knew that. Because oh, wow. with with, when Mussolini was in charge with those big statues on the front of the stadium, it was, you know, this was the national stadium built by the fascists to host the World Cup. Or it might have been built earlier, but it was renovated for the World Cup under Mussolini. So there is some symbolism there. But yeah, specifically that Mussolini set up a, a quite like almost like a Hollywood, like the origins of the China Chitta, the, the the studio lot that to this day exists outside of Rome. Uh, a lot of that was all the groundwork was laid by Mussolini and his government. But Rossellini and his followers were all, you know, um, aiming to make a cinema that was consciously anti-fascist if we, it, before that term became overused. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, I, the 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 term that I hear associated with those kind of earlier Italian films and the Italian films that would have been popular certainly under the fascist government would have been what were called white telephone films, and they were called white telephone films because uh, most people couldn't afford to have telephones that were white, mm -hmm. so they were mostly the concerns of wealthier people. Right, right? they There's, were to use if we want to use the language, they were bourgeois cinema yeah they yeah showcased an aspirational lifestyle of what italian life in the 30s could be yeah and so yeah so the neorealist films are, are a real sort of reaction against that so the poverty, first, poverty is a common theme in almost all of the neorealist films right yeah, yeah yeah and and the first major one is um probably op a rome, open rome. City. i think rome is the first like it was yeah. literally made well Still, war yeah, still, still going, going on, on. Yeah. and the fact that uh, Fellini was the screenwriter on the film means that you get that origin of Rossellini and Fellini there in that movie, mm -hmm. right? So it's a really it's the germination the, of the movement. Yeah, really. and to, and to uh, for, for those who don't know Roberto Rossellini, he's uh, famously Ingrid Bergman's husband mm -hmm. and uh, father of uh, Isabella Isabel Rossellini. Rossellini. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, oh, Rome Open City, which is which it's itself is an anti-fascist film. I mean, that's literally, a, it's about people fighting and being captured by the the fascists. In the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Paisan, which is the next. I love that one. That, yeah, it's I, a great I know Martin Scorsese said that's his favorite of the trilogy, the war trilogy. It's yeah, Paisan. it's it is great. I I have it. I have a hard time though with episodic movies. Uh, but I still think that that's a great, yeah. I still think Pajon is great, but it is like, it's a five part movie essentially, mm -hmm. right? Five different. And they're not necessarily, they're just all about American soldiers and uh, the liberation of Italy moving up from the, from Africa, from Sicily through. Yeah. It is a great movie. And then it's the great. final film in the trilogy is, uh, you know, Germany year zero. Yeah. 
set. Which I've not seen. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I will just say that to anyone who seeks out that film, the the ending of Bicycle Thieves is not nearly as sad as the end of oh, really? Year Zero, which I would rank among the most devastating films in movie history, up there with if anyone knows the the Studio Ghibli uh, film Grave of the Fireflies. Um, I would say okay. that it owes more than a little bit to Germany Year Zero. Oh well. That sounds perfect for for this channel. So maybe I'll do that. One. I, I like. I think I, I said at the at the end of the last one in the um, in the Gilgamesh one that um, that I wanted to do an Italian cinema course this year at the university. That would have been awesome. Yeah. Would have been great. Uh, didn't get it, and uh, thought, okay, well, I'll do I'll do something like that on here. Yeah. Um, and I think I would have ended up starting that class with Bicycle Thieves as well. Maybe Rome Open City, but probably Bicycle Thieves. But that, that would have meant that I would have had to have done a Rossellini film. Yeah. So maybe Germany Year Zero will, will be that one. Yeah, that could be really good. If I'm going chronal, if because I don't know. When does that one come out? They're, 40, all, they're all pretty early. I think 48, all, 49, around that time. Um, I can find it very quickly. Yeah. Um, okay. So, well, it's, I mean, it's 48 as well. 48 as well. Okay. Well, maybe that'll be the next one. Maybe that'll be the next one I do. Um, so, uh, okay. What else do you want? There's lots. Well, I think we keep saying more about this. It's. Oh yeah, I think so. So, so, I mean, along those lines actually with the, with the movie as a reaction against the sort of white telephone fascist, uh, uh, style films. I don't know. I don't know if they're, they're fascist style films, but they come out of a fascist regime. Right. Um, they, um, we see in this movie uh, a lot, a lot of American film posters. Uh, obviously, the big one is he's Rita putting up. Yeah, Rita Hayworth. I think it. I think it's Gilda, but I don't know. Maybe I just associate. I think you're right. I think you're right. And um, but but almost everywhere they go, that there's there's posters. And when he when he tracks down the bicycle thief at the end of the film. Um, who I think is the actual bicycle thief, but this time, even this time around, I was going back and forth between the scene where he's the guy steals the bike and the guy at the end, and I still am not certain if it's actually him or not. I know that he's there's only one bicycle thief that's credited in in the yeah. movie, but I, I really don't know if it's the same guy. It is also interesting the the two moments of solidarity also that his the the bicycle thief's neighbors all defend him. Yeah, that's right. Right, that's and, right. That, and cast Antonio out, which is yeah. yeah, and they're effective in their solidarity, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, when they go up to his room, because he goes up to search for the bike in in this the bicycle thief's room, and um, there's um, again posters on his wall of American movie stars. Um, what do you think that's about? Like, is that is is that a nod to the fact that? You know, this movie's a reaction against Hollywood cinema as well, or or just the general pervasiveness of that. Is it is it to show the distinction between the glamour of the Hollywood world versus the non glamorous world that they're all living in? Yeah, maybe. I think I'm not sure how critical they were of Hollywood. Um, I'm not sure that the uh, that opposition would have been seen the exact same way, especially given the role that the Americans played in uh, liberating Italy and the, you know, like, as we just talked about Paisan, like the, you know, the role of Americans in that film. Um, I think that though, there's definitely a contrast between the glamor and the, the gritty realism, but I was kind of gotten a, a sense that these films like, there's a little bit where the characters actually like these movies give hope in a sense, right? I mean, putting up the movie posters is his job. It's going to mm -hmm. like save him from poverty. The movie it's it's like the escapism of the movie escapism per se isn't bad, right? In terms of what it might offer as uh, an escape from the day-to-day -day drudgery, but it's not enough and it's not reality. Mm -hmm. right? So, it, it's something that you see in a lot of what I, I mean, if we were to talk more about other films that you might place broadly in terms of like leftist politics and stuff, whether it's in the UK, even the, you know, something like Terrence Davies or, or you know, uh, I just recently last year watched uh, Distant Voices Still Lives, many years, set many years later, but 
or made many years later, but set actually in England around the same time, mm -hmm. this film and the way that uh, movies and drinking and singing offer a respite to the working class characters. Mm -hmm. And the film doesn't want to say that that's bad mm -hmm. it says that's all they got, mm -hmm. but it's not enough. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I, that's kind of like, I'm like my thought, you know, in this, I don't think it's maybe as explicit as in that, but the idea that, yeah, you know, movies are important. Telling stories is important. Going to the movies and having that escape is, uh, you know, it's sometimes all people got, but it's not enough. It's not going to put food on your table. Yeah. But and in this so, case, maybe it will a little bit if you put in the poster up, right? Yeah, except except it doesn't. It doesn't <laughs> because you got to have a bicycle. Yeah. I mean, Fellini kind of plays with that, right? Yeah. And, and I, I, I've... I, Amor Cord, which is another one of my favorite yeah, movies. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah, it has a kind of famous moment in the movie theater as well. Yeah, it's common. Fellini's films are like even La Strada it deals with the role of entertainment in yeah. that era, right? Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. and then you get that in literally an eight and a half. He's a filmmaker and stuff. Like yeah. That, which is a bit he's, different. He's very Tarantino esque in his obsession with the, with yeah. the movies. But, uh, but yeah, I would say movies play a role in these characters' lives. In the way that if you were to make a similar movie today, um, you know, maybe it would be television streaming or uh, video games or something. I don't know. But but I think and I think that's important for people to realize that like these movies, like the cinema culture is so different today. Like, you know, some people I'm glad that, you know, one of one of our audience members want to watch the movie. But um, cinema is a, a niche, especially old cinema is a niche interest. Right. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't at the time, right? Just like we have to recognize that whatever we, what we might call vernacular entertainments, the 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 entertainments of the the common people, the everybody, um, change over time, right? And things that were once meant for everyone. I mean, even opera, right? Like, like, and then cinema, and mm -hmm. then you know, television. Now, even you know, I think some people have you know. I think that now video games are the most, uh, but in terms of the amount of money and time people spend on entertainments is the biggest thing now, but like it shifts over time and mm -hmm. recognizing that these movies would have played a more central cultural role. There was no television apart from radio and sport, like the soccer game and stuff like that. The cinema was the place that everybody went. Yeah. Yeah. Although interestingly enough, nobody goes to the movies in this no. movie. Maybe they can't afford the, 10 lira or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Or the popcorn. That's where they really get you. But, yeah. but um, yeah. So one of the, one thing that also that I want to ask you is what you think of the role of belief is in this movie, because um, you know, we, there's that moment where they're in that church and I, and I really was trying to pay some kind of attention today to see, or, or the other day when I watched it <clears throat> to see at what point does Antonio recognize the fact that he's in a church and he doesn't, he's just so singularly focused on this old man that's in there. Um, and then they create this commotion and, and he's clearly after, after him, but where does he end up going at the end of near the end of the movie, but he goes to, he ends up going to the fortune teller that his wife mm -hmm. goes to at the, at the beginning of the yep. movie. And I feel like at some, on some level, the is saying something there about sort of maybe the nature of spirituality at that point, what uh, has, you know, the point that Antonioni ends up raising in more significant detail in about 15 years from this point on um, that Italy has, or the world has lost its kind of spiritual center um and not necessarily any specific religious center but they've lost touch with very basic things like love i mean antonioni's movies are are just emotionless films for the most part or, or no. they're not emotionless but they're filled no. with people who don't have emotion people who are alienated from human experience right yeah exactly and and so i wonder if that's partly what's going on that that sort of in 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 this environment you have a people who have become 
because they're so singularly focused on, I have to make money to feed my family, I have to make money to survive, that they've lost all sense of what, what is important. And the only kind of sense of spirituality that you see is, are these hucksters who, uh, who, who, who draw- Who are money. Who are, who are making money, yeah, exactly. Right, like I think that's a key thing is like when they first go to the, the old, I just have to see this old woman. I just have to see this old woman, right? She yeah. Maria says, like, I just, I just need to go see her. And he's like, why, why do you gotta do this? It's like, oh, but she predicted you get the job. And it's like, he's like, that's stupid, right? Yeah. But, and then he himself is drawn into it. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I haven't thought a lot about, I didn't think a lot about that actually when I was watching it. Um, I think he's definitely probably trying to make some sort of connection there. But I think it, but that now that I think about it, that given the trajectory of the movie, I don't think it's as uh, critical or it's critical, but it's, it actually suggests there might be some value in it mm. to some degree. In, in, in the fortune teller. Yeah. In that, it get, in, in the same in the way communal, that it yeah. gives, oh, commu okay. Or in the, yeah, but and in the, the sense, it gives you hope. A, hope, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, so what if you spent, it's like, it's the same sort of thing. It's like, yeah, you go to a movie and you spend, you know, a bit of few cents or lira back in the day and you get an hour and a half or two hours of, escapism for you can forget about the poverty of your life for a minute the, the same way the belief the the fortune teller offers you you know a moment to yeah this is going to happen to something good's going to happen to me right like mm -hmm. it's funny fortune tellers never tell you it's like you're screwed just take <laughs> off right like um the likewise you know a, a church might offer some you know and i think this is where some people of faith would take issue they'd be like well it's it's not the same right but but i think for many people it functions the same i right. think recognizing that outside of certain academic philosophical religious people for the vast majority of people these things function similarly um and and then you know it's like a lottery ticket i mean we can we can decry lotteries but you know a dollar to have some hope even right. if you don't win that's something, okay. right? As long as it doesn't destroy your life, but to have that ticket that there's a chance I might get out of this. I mean, who hasn't? Like, I don't play the lottery, but every once in a while I'm like, you know, I know the I know the odds are so astronomically ridiculous that it's not even worth the two dollars or whatever for a six forty nine ticket or whatever. Yeah. But there are moments when I'm like, but what if I did win? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? I could be the one. I would, I would somebody's gonna win. Yeah. Right? Somebody's gotta win. Yeah um why not me why not yeah, me yeah. Right? and is that not what antonio like somebody's got to win why not me yeah yeah that's right somebody, somebody gets a job why not me somebody's would you say that uh the brothel functions the same way because that's also and that's yeah. of the places he goes it's almost like a tr interesting trajectory from yeah. the church to the fortune teller oh, to yeah, the too. brothel totally yeah, yeah. probably yeah. probably does yeah you know um like yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, one last question. Uh, let's talk about the wife for just a second. Sure, Maria. She, I think she's great. Like, I think yeah, that she the is. wife she's is, is, but uh, she really drops out of the movie after after the first half hour or so. Yeah, yeah she's gone. So, um, I, well, I, I really don't know what to say about that other than just to say, like, what do you think? What do you think about that? Like, the fact that we just don't ever see her again. Um, it's the, he could have to see it could have easily done a scene where like at the very end they where they come home. back. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad he didn't, yeah. but, uh, but he could have done something like that. But uh, uh, I think the film is, seems to be very attentive to the, the labor and the role that women play. Interestingly, even if it's, it's in the background. Yeah. Um, you know, she's working constantly. She, uh, you know, it's her, she's her idea to sell the sheets, get the money. Um, she's in some ways, despite the fact that he is the one who functions in public for the family. In some ways, she does seem to be kind of in charge of the house, mm -hmm. right? In the private domain, she's in charge and she tells him what to do. You mm -hmm. put your uniform on, put your hat on straight, do this, do this, you know, mm -hmm. like, and I think that reflects the, the cultural norms the, the pre feminist era, Italy, a Catholic country. I think it also shows that, you know, well, we, that might not be, you know, our preferred or ideal ethical position for women that the, the stereotype of women being completely, you know, just 
constantly oppressed and prisoners wasn't true. It was just a different kind of social structure. And that, but then how much better would it be if we could, you know, get everybody involved, if she could get out go and get a job too or whatever, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. So yeah. it both, it both is like, I think, uh, just representative of time. It's not, uh, it shows us that sometimes our stereotypes of the past are not what we think they are. And yet at the same time it is obviously shows the limits of possibility and, and you know, and I would not fall to any woman for saying, I do not want that life. <laughs> yeah. No, it, do, it doesn't, it, it doesn't look pleasant for anybody in this. No. In it this seems place. like a lot of work. Well, that water she's carrying. At the I know. Yeah. I always actually that's what I thought last night when I was like, "Why doesn't he just carry the can, the bucket of water for?" <laughs> you know, like, or he could carry a bucket too, and you get two buckets of water. He does. He does end up taking one. Yeah. He does end up taking one. But, but 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 there's this assumption that certain forms of labor within the home will be done by her. Yes, that's right. Cooking, cleaning, right. laundry, yeah. the social connection with like the fortune teller and the other people in the neighborhood. The, yeah. Like in some ways, he Antonio's a child too. Oh yeah, yeah, like definitely. Her, like like Bruno, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, well, and yeah, it's because I mean, of his lack of employment, he is left with that. That's his own. In one sense, a man's only power in that culture comes from his ability to be a breadwinner. He actually right. has no very little agency or power within his home, right? Other than his ability to exert his, uh, you know, legal rights over his wife and children. In some sense. Um, so for him, as you, to return to one of your original points, the point of humiliation, right? If he can't provide for his family, then he's, they might say he's not a man, you know, the, the yeah. godfather. Kind well, of, that's, that's probably why we, there's we, a masculinity issue. Yeah. We kind of see him and Bruno virtually on the same level throughout the whole film. Yeah. Cause I mean, as you say, like with Bruno being employed, I mean, Bruno in some ways has more power. It was like the age of my son. He's like nine years old. <laughs> it's crazy. It is goes insane. for a job. Like I'm just imagining my son, who's like in grade five, going into grade five, be like, "All right, Dad, off to go sweep the halls at the mall." And it's like, what? Like that'd be bizarre, right? Like just the whole expectations around child labor have radically changed in since our grandparents' lifetimes. Yeah, I think that's, gonna, that's the other thing I always remind myself. Like literally, my father-in-law was born the year after this movie came out. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. My my father. Well, I guess I I don't know. <laughs> my father was yeah. alive when this movie came. Yeah. Out. No. My my uh, my um, you know my, my my wife always gets angry at me because I play this. I love playing this little temporal game. I'm like, did you know that we're actually closer to X time? It's like you know <laughs> the famous story that like you know Jesus Christ lived closer to us than to the building of the ancient the Great Pyramids, right? Right. One of those weird things. Right. I'm like, I was born closer to World War II than to today. Right. The world well, has changed radically, radically. Yeah. yeah. I think that the one that uh, hit me the hardest was that the Wonder Years, it's been a, it's been a longer time since the Wonder Years aired than the oh, time absolutely. that it was a talking lot, like, about. Like double. Yeah, much longer. Time, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it doesn't have the, the same gravitas yeah. as World War II, but nevertheless. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> but yeah, or you pick music, you know, like. Yeah. Nirvana is older to my son than the Beatles were to me. Right. Well, I remember being a kid and I went to, in Toronto, there was a celebration for the 20th anniversary of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Being exactly. Released. That was 1987. I was seven years old and I went to, and I went to, I don't know where it was. Um, that must've been a it, formative experience for you. It was, it was exciting. There was a, there was a, um, it was my first uh, Beatles cover band that I saw. And, uh, and it was I'd probably around City Hall or or some something like that. And and I remember it being a big deal. Like there was a lot that happened in that 20 year anniversary. The CD came out. That was when the CD came out that year. And there was all these like cardboard cutouts and things on the radio and all sorts of things. Well, it's been it's been 30 more than 30 years since then. Yeah. So well, it's crazy. It's uh, you know. It's, maybe that's a banal observation, but I think some of us, it's like cognitively difficult sometimes to, to recognize that. Yeah. Um, it was interesting. I, so I've taught a Asian cinema class. Yeah. And one of the films I teach for talk teaching uh, Chinese cinema, particularly the fifth and sixth generation. So Chinese cinema 
sort of the waves they, they talk about, like there's the fifth generation, sixth generation of people born since the revolution and like who are in the, the, the classes that come out of the film school and stuff like that. But there's a, a film, a 2000, I want to say 2002 or 2003 film called Beijing Bicycle. Did oh you, yeah, you know I've heard of that. have you seen it? No, no, I haven't seen it. But it's I've basically it. the Chinese version of this film, but it's set in okay. 2002. The young man gets a job as a delivery guy for the bike. The bike is stolen by someone, and he has to go find it in Beijing, massive right. city, right? Like, and, and deals with a lot of similar issues of poverty and things like that. It's, I wouldn't say it's as good as this one. I mean, in some sense, a bit derivative, but it's very interesting and in giving a portrait of you know the emerging. Uh, economy in the early 2000s in China as it was building and and just what day-to-day -day life for you know an average worker in Beijing might be like as opposed to you know the the, the more uh, you know jet-setting elite class of people that we, yeah. we might be more uh, familiar with so if you haven't if you've seen Bicycle Thieves and you you know it might be it's worth checking out Beijing Bicycle if you ever get a chance is that on that Criterion channel? It's not. No, might be hard. You might be able to track down a, a DVD at a library or something. Right, right, right. But. Cool. Well, that's cool. Well, is there is there are there other things about the movie that we didn't talk about that you'd like to talk about? Um, we talked about the title briefly. We talked about neorealism. I think you had some really great. Uh, you know, you brought up some things I hadn't thought about in terms of belief and faith and that. To me, I always see the, you think of neorealism as a very like, uh, like materially oriented like uh, cinema, cinema about like you know, the struggle to live each day. But I think you point out very well that um, all those other things are part of that day to day struggle. Yeah. Right? Whether it's a restaurant or a movie or church or a fortune teller, you know. Or, I think that I think that Catholicism played such a dominant role in Italy, mm -hmm. still does. But I think yeah, that it yeah. played it played such a big one then, bigger one, that um, it's it's you can almost like find it in every single Italian Absolutely. movie made during that, that period. And I would go so far as to say, like you, you mentioned Antonioni and the and you know some of the sort of more existentially inflected cinema later on uh, is dealing with. Like I would say Fellini is like about someone who is, you know, lost their faith, but is like struggling to re restructure a, a sense of uh, selfhood in the, the ruins of the iconography of church and, and things like that in some ways. Yes. And yes. so like you, you're right. You, even if you're an explicitly a Marxist atheist, you cannot escape it to the point that later on per Paolo Pasolini, the uh you know the, atheist, the man who made the scariest movie of all time yes but the the in his atheist uh marxist queer identity made what is in my opinion one of the the best uh films based on the gospels so oh the gospel of gospel uh, according to saint matthew which is yeah, a, yeah. A, also a neorealist film it, on non-professional actors and it's a uh, very interesting in that way I haven't seen that movie either. I should. I should. I should oh, watch check that. it out. It's good. Yeah, I will. I went on a bit of a. I've ne I've never totally hooked into Pasolini. He's now. I haven't seen that movie. Maybe that's the one I should yeah. see. Yeah. But I haven't seen very many Pasolini films. So I watched that trilogy. You know, his like Canterbury yep. Tales, Arabian Nights one. Yep. I, I don't know. There was something. Uh, it was. It was. It was. It was a little bit. It was kind of like a less funny Monty Python movie. <laughs> I can see that. I can see that. That's yeah. what it seemed like to me. But it was, yeah. it was, it was, it was all, they were, they were fine. But I've never actually watched Salo myself. So I can't. I've never watched it either. I don't I think to, I might just have to do it one day. I might just have to do it. I don't know. Okay. Well, maybe I'll do it. I won't eat for a day and then we'll, yeah. we'll, I'll watch it. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I've seen Mama Roma, which is, uh, which I is, do that. It's good, but again, to me, it sort of lacks. It has. It's another one of those movies that ends with a big sort of emotional mm -hmm. moment, but I don't think it. The payoff is as good as it is in, in a movie like Bicycle Thieves because yeah. the the he he doesn't do as good of a job of of building that world. That's my opinion. I think that maybe there are other people who would probably feel like he does a fantastic job of it, but mm -hmm. I wasn't as invested in those characters as I was in the, in the bicycle.
thief characters. Yeah. So. Oh, you got me, uh, you know, thinking about Italian cinema again here, which I periodically come back to. It's uh, well, it's a good one. If you want to come back and talk about Germany Year Zero, you can. Uh, okay. I'll have to rewatch it then too. Yeah. I, well, I'll have to watch it for the first time. But uh, yeah, I, wa I watched it when it came out on the that Criterion DVD set about what now ten years ago maybe. Yeah. So I've been watching Rossellini movies in chronological order, but obviously I have not got far. I just watched uh, the first oh, open, uh, Rome Open City and okay. uh, those and are the only two you've seen. Oh, that's it. You got some excitement because I think. Uh, my probably my favorite is Voyage to Italy. Oh yeah, okay. film, which is funny, with Ingrid Bergman, his wife, and George yeah. Sanders. And uh, yeah, flower. Speaking of religious iconography again, Flower Saint Francis. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, Rossellini. It's good. Italian filmmakers were actually quite Trombole. good. At making, were quite good at making English language yeah. movies. Well, that think? partly has to do with the legacy of. Italian cinema, which is that we, we actually haven't mentioned, but I believe like very almost in all cases, one of the reasons they, you dub over. You're right. right. There's no, they don't, they, don't, they don't record live sync. That's right. And I believe this movie is the same way too. Right. Uh, Bicycle Thieves. Yeah. was not yeah. recorded because in no. fact, I think, I think the, the, the Ricci, the, the main character, I don't think that's his voice. Yeah. They dubbed him over. Right. Yeah. yeah. But that, that and that's just kind of, that goes back to the production uh, style of the uh, when they, they established the cinema in the twenties and thirties to uh, up to the you know the classic nineteen sixties uh, you know like we you and I just recently watched uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood right you go yeah the, the films of the you know spaghetti westerns and, uh, that's and right. uh, Sergio Corbucci that's and right yeah Sergio Leone um, yeah dubbing over it and allowed these different actors I mean. La Strada. It's why you know you can Anthony have Quinn. Anthony Quinn in that role. I I just I love um, um, the leopard. The idea of the leopard and um, Burt Lancaster. Burt Lancaster probably not even knowing what he was saying in that in that movie. I mean, I'm sure and he was. You know, that's the one that I needed to I need to watch one of these. I know. So, I know. My my newfound love of Burt Lancaster as well. Burt Lancaster is great. I think Burt he's Lancaster's fantastic. You know, the last couple of years going through a lot of his films, I. I think, you know, right from the beginning and the killers to like Field mm -hmm. of Dreams. What a career. Oh. What a career. That's a great bookend when you think of it. Yeah. Killers to Field of Dreams is pretty good. Did you see that? This is completely off topic, but did you see that? I, film I did movie? watch the uh the baseball game, yeah. Oof. That was something. That movie, awesome. that movie again, not not considered to be in the same level as a movie like Bicycle Thieves, but it it hits me just as hard as Bicycle Thieves. No, does. absolutely. I mean, yeah. We could we could do a discussion on baseball sometime. That oh, movies, shit. that would be fun. And another great father son movie. It is, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Well, we'll we should end it here. But sure. uh, thank you so much for doing this. No, it's really fun. It's fun. It. I yeah, hope people enjoyed it. I hope so too. I think that they did. I think that it was. Uh, I think it was a, a really interesting conversation. I hope you come back to talk about anything yeah, else. Anytime. And. Um, also, I think I, if Anton would be interested in doing, I can. I think I can only get another person on at uh, uh, at a time because I have cheaped out and only got the free version of Streamyard. But um, but I think that uh, maybe last three, yeah, maybe, yeah, it's, it's quite possible. Yeah. It's quite possible. But yeah, if he's the logistic, yeah, the logistics might be maybe we can get. I mean, if, if not, I can just I can you know have my brother come. Ha, have him there. We That's true. The, we can be in the same room. Yeah. That's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah, we can make it work. Um, do you want to plug anything before you go? Yeah, no, nah, check out threebrothersfilm.com. Check out uh, Three Brothers Film Cast, our, our pod monthly. It's a monthly podcast. We got a couple extra episodes, uh, and me and my my brothers sort of kind of go in depth on a monthly topic. This summer, we've done a lot of like more like mainstream blockbuster -y type things. We've talked about the Fast and Furious films, 90s summer blockbusters. Um, yeah, so. Give it a check. You can find that on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. That's yeah. Fun. It's an awesome podcast. I, I listen to them all. Can I ask you a question actually about that? Sure. The the clip at the beginning, uh, my last name is the same as my brother's. Yeah, yeah. What's that from? It's from the social network. It's oh. about, uh, the Winklevoss twins. Oh, okay. When, and they're meeting with the, the president, Larry Summers, president of Harvard at the time, right? 
Anyway. I, I, I haven't seen if that movie. You, I, that's a movie that you have. I know you've. Uh, we've had this conversation before. You, you really want Social me to Network is David Fincher's best film. I oh, should. I should watch it. I should watch it. It's got Definitely. only gotten better in the last decade. I'm sure it has. I'm sure it has. Because that guy. It's just infuriating too, though. That guy is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> the face. What's that? Zuckerberg is the well, worst. Someone will be finding this uh, show after the fact on Facebook, and then Zuck will take it <laughs> off. But, um, Sorry, Mark. I mean, Sorry. But no, Mark, um, Mark, you should be flattered. You know, you had a move, one of the greatest films of the century so far made about you. There you go. Even if it's not very flattering. There you um, go. That's, that's no, the um, yeah, there's actually, so we, in our intro, for anyone who hasn't listened to it yet, we use a bunch of little clips in the intro. And yeah, you know, we, yeah. when we were, when we were producing the show, you know, we, we had, you know, there's like the Darjeeling Limited because it's, I know that's not most people's favorite Wes Anderson film. It's not necessarily my favorite, but because of the three brothers dynamic, it, it's very appropriate. Yeah. um and yeah my my country you know and we have a little yeah i'll let someone watch it see if you can identify a couple of the other clips you know my favorite the one i suggested was like before we mo move from the intro to the discussion of the main show it's like all right ramblers let's get rambling and oh yeah from what's, what's uh, that from dustle dawn oh <laughs> george <okay>. clooney <laughs> was that george clooney who says that yep oh, i gotta listen more carefully next time okay okay yeah, I, I have seen that one. I believe but, that line is also in uh, it's one in one other Tarantino film as well. But it sounds like a death proof line, but I'm not sure if that's true. Or yeah, not. I think it's it's in I think it's in more than one Tarantino yeah. film. So yeah, awesome. Yeah, go listen yeah. to that. Go look at the website. There's a lot of great stuff on the. On yeah, the we're just wrapping up this week. Our so far this year, our uh, uh, in depth look at the films of Zack Snyder. So if you're a uh, Either a hater or a, a lover of Zack Snyder. Check it out. Which one are you? I like most of his films. Yeah. There's, I actually think they're underrated in some ways. Mm -hmm. I think that many people's criticisms are not um, completely unfounded, but that I enjoy them nonetheless. And I think they uh, sell short some of his uh, visual and thematic uh, interests. But yeah. So if you ever want to read a impassioned defense of Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice, the much maligned uh, 2016 film, check out my yes. review. You make a good case. You do make a very good case, which I've used in, in I've, I've shamelessly no. stolen. Well, no in, problem. In Thanks. Case. Thanks for uh, sharing that, you know, because I have, the, I have the unpopular opinion of preferring that movie to any Marvel film. So now people will not check out my podcast. Like, this, guy's <laughs> cra this guy's crazy, but that's where you get the hot you'll takes, know, Yeah, you'll know you'll be getting some uh, interesting, uh, you know, counter counterintuitive takes, but not just for the sake of, uh, you know, controversy, but from some idiosyncratic and unique uh, thoughts on the film. So, in a well thought out place. I hope so. Yeah. Hope so. Absolutely. Anyway, yeah, I appreciate this this conversation opportunity to talk about a an older movie. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, so I, I'll, we'll, I will end it here. But uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. And we'll I don't know what the next one is, but we'll see you in the next one. Take awesome. care. Bye-bye. Take care.